and welcome to the Game Design Podcast. My name is Brad Carney, and I am the founder of Final Boss Entertainment, who recently developed Rack. If you're unfamiliar with what Rack is, just imagine a game that hasn't gotten any publicity whatsoever, and that's basically Rack. So just a couple of quick show notes before we proceed. We are getting the website all updated, so should be looking all nice and pretty. We got the logo done, so that's that's looking really cool. We've got a new YouTube channel all set up, so if you'd rather subscribe to the podcast through YouTube, uh, you can certainly do that. Uh, that's also a great place to leave comments and all that fun stuff. And we're also getting the show submitted to iTunes. Uh, by the time this goes up, we should have that all set up. Um, hoping to do that all pretty soon here. So it, coming up pretty soon, you should be able to subscribe to the show in plenty of different ways, which should be awesome. Anyway, on with the show. So this week, I wanted to dive into the topic of balance. I think it's something that primarily comes up in multiplayer games that have the player pick a class or loadout from several different options. For example, in Street Fighter, you pick a single character to fight as out of a pool of 20 or 30 or however many possible characters are in that particular game. In Sanctum 2, you pick a few different weapons, towers, perks, all before the game starts. And when it comes to these situations, I'm pretty sure we've all at least heard discussions about this at one point or another. You'll hear people talk about the characters being overpowered and needing to be nerfed like Rosalina and the new Smash Brothers, or Virgil in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, the bane of my existence. Or you'll talk about others being weak and low tier and needing buffs like the Spike Traps and Orcs Must Die or Dalzim in Street Fighter 4. Now, I think we can all agree that it's certainly bad when a game lacks balance. When a certain character or weapon or loadout is so much better than the rest, it makes it difficult to stay competitive if they're not picked, if not impossible. It makes the choice of what to pick meaningless and robs the player of any sort of reward for being analytical. We're all familiar with the game Rock, Paper, Scissors, right? If Rock beat both Paper and Scissors, it'd obviously be a pretty stupid game, right? Either you just pick Rock, or you would clearly not know how the game works. In any case, the game would quickly be forgotten. Now, when a game first comes out, it doesn't explicitly tell you, this character is amazing, pick them to have any hope of winning, like Rock in the previous example. So, if you have great analytical skills, maybe you can identify this character before everybody else, but in the age of the internet, you're not likely to have that edge for very long. Today, people all over the world can talk and share videos instantly, so any new technique or exploit or insight can spread like wildfire to anybody who cares to listen. So if you've got some new unblockable with Kirby, good luck keeping that to yourself for very long. Does, does, does Smash have unblockables? I don't know, I don't play that game. So it's better when everything is equal in a game, right? That seems to be the conventional wisdom, but I would actually argue that it's not. Remember what I said earlier about how overpowered characters rob you of any sort of meaningful choice? Well, the same goes for when everything is perfectly balanced as well. If a Street Fighter game had 30 different recolored reuse, and by the way, make your own joke here, would it really matter which one you picked? If I flip a coin, does it really matter if you pick heads or tails? Are you being mentally engaged in any way? It's not a trick question, the answer is no. Alright, so if it's bad when a game has overpowered characters, and it's bad when a game is perfectly balanced, then what's the right way to achieve balance? If it's bad when one character is good, and it's bad when no characters are good, then, huh, what's the game designer supposed to do? And the answer is that you do want everything to be balanced situationally. And that's really the key. You want players to take various factors into consideration. Your personal playstyle, the environment you're playing in, your opponents, how your opponent's pick matches up against your pick, just to name a few. If you're playing a first person shooter and pick up a new weapon, and you have to decide whether or not to get rid of your current weapon and keep the new one, based on things like the size of the level, damage, the players or enemies you're up against, your own personal abilities, suddenly the decision is a lot more meaningful and rewarding. By making the right decision, you get to dominate more as a player, and that feels great. 
So going back to an example I think we're all familiar with, Street Fighter, there's a wide variety of characters in that game that appeal to many different play styles. When it comes to fighting games, there are three different styles that people generally categorize. You have zoning, which is when you try and keep opponents away and chip away at them. Grappling, which is when you try and get up close and guess what your opponent is going to do and then counter it. And then rushing, which is when you get close and overwhelm your opponent with your offense. And Street Fighter has characters that suit each of these playstyles. Zoners have Ryu and Dalsim, Grapplers have Zangief and T-Hawk, and Rushers have Akuma and El Fuerte. And I'm sure there's hardcore Street Fighter fans already complaining about my choice of examples. Ryu's not a zoner! So what exactly do playstyles and character variety have to do with balance? Even though each game generally has a short list of characters considered top tier, most players still won't benefit from picking those characters. If the best character in a particular game is a zoner, and you're a natural grappler, you're probably never going to end up being great with the best character in the game. You're actually likely to do far better with a good character that suits your playstyle. And I think a fairly famous example of this is Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition, which was famously intentionally unbalanced. It introduced two new characters to Street Fighter 4, Yun and Yang, who were clearly head and shoulders above the rest of the cast. So at the biggest fighting game tournament in the world, Evolution, everyone who finished in top 8 in 2011, the year Arcade Edition was out, used either Yun or Yang, right? Nope. There were actually only two Yoon players in top 8. The one who placed higher was Daigo Umehara who got 4th, and the previous year he actually won with Ryu, a character more conducive to his style. Would he have done better that year if he had stuck it out with Ryu? Nobody knows for sure, but throwing playstyle out of the wind and going by tier list didn't lead him or anybody else to the top that year. And to be fair, the guy who won actually did use Feilong, which was also considered incredibly strong that year, so who knows, but most of the people in top 8 that year stuck to their guns. Coming up, I'll be talking with Andrew Rosnowski about his experience with balance across many different games. So I'm joined now by Andrew Rovznowski here, uh, here, here in the studio, and the studio being my kitchen. We were going to do this over Skype yesterday, but ran into some technical difficulties. And if you're wondering what day we're recording this on, all I have to say is uh, llama drama and dresses. So probably come Monday, no, everyone's going to have forgotten about that. No one's going to know what we're talking about. But I wanted to have you on uh, on this episode because we're, we're talking about balance today. And I really wanted to get get uh, the, pers the perspective of a player, um, you know, someone who's played through a bunch of different games, uh, you know, kind of experienced what it's like to be on the receiving end of good balance, bad balance, how it kind of affects games. But uh, yeah, so, so thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, like Brad said, I'll go just a little bit through my history. So sure, yeah. yeah. I uh, I grew up, you know, playing video games like everyone else did in the '90s. Uh, you know, like playing Super Nintendo and stuff like that. And uh, you know, we the had good a old days. That's right. We had a copy of you know Street Fighter Two. My brother would he'd play Chen Li and do lightning kick. You know, just press kick repeatedly. And I'd play him Bison, who's a boss. I think and you I'd, just called your brother a masher. I did. Uh, <laughs> Hello, but uh, <laughs> no, and I would do the slide kick, which is just you'd crouch and kick, and you know the rounds would just go like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I played, you know, I had a bunch of friends who, you know, we played video games growing up. You know, I got hooked on GoldenEye when it came out for Nintendo sixty four. Then uh, the game that really launched me into really being a lot more competitive and a lot more serious was a. Uh, Marvel vs. Capcom 2. And, Which is actually know, were what we met through. Yeah, we. that's how I met Brad and everything. Uh, I played a ton of StarCraft. I played that, you know, pretty much... I, I played it fairly competitively. And then, you know, I played NFC 2 throughout the entire lifespan of the game, basically. Um, I played other games like Halo 2 competitively in college. Uh, you know, I, I've played a little bit of everything. So, yeah, I kind of have a good idea of what's, you know cheap quote-unquote i'm sure we'll get into that you know, <laughs> yeah yeah definitely. what's good what's bad yeah. stuff like that so yeah 
Well, I, I'm glad you have uh, a lot of experience across a bunch of different genres. I feel like I talked about fighting games way too much in the intro, which I might have to go back and edit a little bit. Mm-hmm. But point is, I mean, balance does kind of apply to a lot of different genres. You know, it's, it's not yeah. just fighting games. It's not even just multiplayer games either. But yeah, yeah. So you you mentioned StarCraft, um, mm-hmm. you know, in, in your your little bio there. Yeah. So it, I mean, that's a game that's survived uh, for quite a while. Like it's still being played yeah. today, right? Or is everyone yeah. kind of moving? Uh, I mean. Starcraft? There, there's still, you know, it's kind of like uh, to go back to our fighting game roots. You know, there's still little scenes of it, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, for the most part, everyone's playing StarCraft too. Gotcha, know. gotcha. It, it's pretty much replaced it all together. And is, is that finished yet completely, or are they still working on? No, there's there's one more. Uh, there's a Legacy of the Void, and okay. I, don't, I actually don't know when it's coming out, but that's mm-hmm. the last version. Okay, know, the last okay, cool, cool. Expansion, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so, I, I mean. Getting back to StarCraft, so like mm-hmm. it, it survived for quite a while, and, and that's a game. Like for those who don't know, it's like it's kind of a space space themed RTS with like four different races, right? Three, three. three. Yeah. Okay, so it's a uh, Terran, mm-hmm. Zerg, and uh, Protoss. Protoss. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So and, you know, and it's kind of like you know they kind of have like archetypes, you know, like Terran or humans, obviously, mm-hmm. and uh, you know they're supposed to be the balanced race, and then uh, Zerg are all organic. You know, they're very fast. They die quicker, mm-hmm. and then Protoss are very tech heavy. They're slower units, more expensive units, but they pack a bigger punch. So, so would you like kind of going back to the example I gave in the intro? Would you mm-hmm. would you kind of say like the Zerg are kind of like the Rushers? The humans are kind of <clears throat> absolutely, like, yeah. I mean, the Zerg are definitely you know, yeah. They're they're always in your face, very offense. Uh, mm-hmm. Their defense is generally a little bit weaker than the other two. Terran, you know, they they're kind of the uh, jack of all trades. So you know, you can play offense, defense pretty well, but you know, they don't necessarily excel in one or the other. Right, right. And then uh, the Protoss are very good defensively for the most part, mm-hmm. and you know, they their units last forever. So, so is is any one race like top tier, like the the best class well, to pick? And you know that that kind of goes back in the uh, you know a little bit of balance. Uh, so uh, yeah, throughout various stages of the game, you know both competitive mindsets and you know the players playing, but also you know the way that the races have been constructed. Yeah, they they've kind of all cycled through. Uh, like in StarCraft Two right now, the current you know like the tournaments that are happening today and everything, mm-hmm. Terran are probably still considered the best. They've been the best in StarCraft Two for a while, mm-hmm. and it's just you know numerous patches that they pushed out and uh the new units they added in this current expansion they really benefit and the other the other races don't really have as good answers the, these things do kind of tend to evolve don't they like mm-hmm. not only through like patches but through new discoveries that players make um yeah you know it's i mean like going back to fighting games like mvc2 marvel vs. capcom 2 it's like when the game first came out you know there, there were characters that everyone thought oh this is clearly the best character in the game everyone yep. should use this blah blah yep. and then as the game went on people discovered more things people developed better execution and skills then other characters started to bubble to the top and yeah those became the characters were if you're not playing this character don't even bother you know playing just the game you know, like I said, you know, not to make it too fighting game heavy, but right, you know, you right. did mention Marvel vs. Capcom too. So, the a perfect example of what Brad is describing is there is a uh, there's a character called Blackheart, and he's yeah. he's a Marvel character. He's uh, the devil's son in the comics. Well, for very early on when the game was first released, he was very he was considered very good. He was on most of the top teams, and you know, a lot of people, you know, they're like, man, this character's really good, but as Brad said, you know, people adapted to him, and they realized it's like, well, you know, this cable guy like completely, you know, has every answer to everything that he can do, and he pretty much, you know, no one played him after four years, I would say, Mm -hmm. of the game, that's being conservative. Yeah, I I mean, some characters like, they, they're easy to pick up and master, Mm -hmm. so like, kind of in the beginning of a game's life cycle, like, those characters will tend to be more dominant and then the ones that require a lot more time to master and are, are better in the long run, mm-hmm. you kind of see those characters start to, to bubble up yeah. over time. So, yeah. like, in, in StarCraft, did mm-hmm. that end up happening at all? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, uh, you know, um, in StarCraft, you know, it's dependent on the maps you play and, you know, you know the Zerg have if it's if you if you like will read like strategies and stuff you know generally there's like a general Zerg idea and basically um, the best thing I can kind of relate to how fighting games have been you know they'll sit there and you know you adapt and you get new strategies is uh, in um, StarCraft there's actually if you read you know a lot of people will talk about like build orders and stuff and basically those are just optimized like hey you know when you have 
this amount of supply, which is the units you can build. You know, you should be building this, mm-hmm. and then you know, five minutes in, you should have X amount of guys in right, the army and right. send them because if you're playing the Protoss. They're not going to have enough guys to rebuff you and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, there's is, a lot of but, different. But stuff does like that, that ever change? Like depending on the situation, <laughs> yes. like you want to prioritize, yep. like depending on what what stage you're on, what the opponent's yeah. doing. So like yeah, just uh, like there are uh, you know there are bigger maps and smaller maps, mm-hmm. and uh, you know. The let's just a easy example is you know Zerg have a their base unit base attack unit is called a Zergling. It's little. It does the attack doesn't do very much, but you can build a lot of them very quickly. Mm-hmm. So basically, what you can do is let's say you have a smaller map that uh, you know the opponent can only be in one or two spawn areas. They have a certain amount of spawn areas per these maps, so you know where they're going to be. They're either going to be here or here. So you know if it's a small enough map, you can build those guys and then send them out early enough Mm -hmm. but if it's a bigger map then it's like well you know there's not as much advantage to building these many guys when you should probably be concentrating on the bigger units and stuff gotcha so it's i mean in all the decisions you're making like it's it's, it sounds like it's definitely not like a a brain dead thing like you gotta be smart you gotta be analytical so i mean the game is rewarding you yeah yeah it's um which i think makes it interesting and and why it's survived to as, as long as it has and yep continues to this day yeah i mean it, you know it, there's a lot of analogs to you know any kind of competitive adventure you know sports mm-hmm. fighting games anything right, like that. right. yeah it, it, it all fits in that it's very interesting yeah i, I mean like even sports go through a lot of you know different evolution you know mm-hmm. from you know players you know, and, and just rule changes and everything i mean yeah. like, like the nfl football like it's gotten yeah. way more offensive heavy because they, they've yeah. changed all the rules so it's like you can't touch the quarterback you know, you can't mm-hmm. do any of these things, so it just makes it so much easier to, to score points. And yeah, yeah. I mean, all there's that. it's all over the place. Yeah. So I, I mean, wh- let's let's change gears a little bit to like mm-hmm. a different genre. So like you said, you you're like a like also like a you were a big Halo player. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, you know, I've, I've kind of thought about how like because I mean, a lot of the games we've talked about, you know, it's it's like there's some kind of loadout or clash you're picking at the beginning. Whereas mm-hmm. something like Halo, it's not quite exactly the same, but I still kind of feel like balance applies in a lot of situations there. Yeah. Like okay, so I mean, for those of you who aren't familiar with Halo, for all two of you out there, <laughs> so it's 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 a game where you know you're you're kind of picking up uh, you know weapons as you go along. So it's like you you instead of like there being pre-placed weapons and like you pick them all up and keep them like you would in a game like Doom or, or Quake. Mm-hmm. It's you're, you're picking up kind of weapons like as you kill enemies and, and whatnot. Yeah. So I, I mean, what a. Uh, when when you're picking up a new weapon, like mm-hmm. is, is there any kind of thought into like, hey, I should I should keep this weapon, you know? Vers- is, is there more to that decision than just like, hey, there's ammo in this weapon. My current one doesn't have any ammo. Cool. Uh, or, or or is there like more thought involved? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you know, I, I hate to say that. That's a you know not a very good answer. No, it's right. Uh, yes, it's an honest one. It's yeah. a good. It's a good. Yes, answer. there is. I mean, you know, there are of course situations where you know it's like, well, I don't have any ammo left let me pick something up sure. right yeah but um you know they different uh different guns have different abilities um so i i can you know i realize there's been there's been a couple halos for sure but I, you know i have most of my experience in halo 2 and halo mm-hmm. 1 mm-hmm. um you know there was a lot of uh you know, basically in Halo Two, for you know, there's two different there's two different races. You know, there's the humans, and then there's the Covenant, is the bad guy, and they have their own weapons. And um, <clears throat> you know, there's a there's a gun. It's a pistol that you can charge up that you don't necessarily start with. Mm-hmm. You can sit there and hold the uh, the I guess the trigger for lack mm-hmm. of a better term, and it will charge up. And the way they did it in Halo was they ha- you have shields, and then you have a little bit of health after your shields mm-hmm. drop. And if you sit there and you know you you know you camp for a little bit, your shields are recovering. Mm-hmm. You can go back out. Well, and, and charging that gets rid of the shields in like one hit, right? Yeah. So basically, what you could do is in Halo Two, you could do a thing called dual wield, so you could have two guns out at the same time. And basically, what you could do in that game is you could charge it up, run around, charge it up, hit someone with it, and then shoot them and kill them. Mm-hmm. And it was very that was a very good strategy. Um, 
you know, some, w- was there ever a time to not use that? Yeah, yeah, there was. I mean, uh, there's a sniper rifle in the game, mm-hmm. of course, and then you know, the bigger stages, it you know, it didn't lend itself as nicely right. to that because you right. know, hey, I can't get it. Right. And there's also vehicles in that game, and that didn't really you know deter that very much because mm-hmm. you couldn't you know you're not gonna damage the the warthog, which is right. just like an ATV yeah. basically. So, so basically, yeah. you've got to take things like the map size into consideration. Yeah, I mean, vehicles. like like in a first. First-person shooter and uh, StarCraft, it like your loadout, you know, for lack of a better term or general strategy, is very dependent on what map or stage mm-hmm. you're going to be playing. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's like, oh, it's a big one, okay, you know, Modern Warfare Two, okay, you know, maybe if you like sniping, it's like, okay, I can do my sniping mm-hmm. stuff. But if it's a small condensed map, it's like, eh, maybe I should yeah. go my melee stuff and stuff. So. Yeah, and you know, I, I mean, you know, c- kind of talking about the sniping a little bit. I, I mean, that's that's definitely one of the big criticisms I have of games like. Quake three and mm-hmm. and I, I guess Counter Strike to to an extent I haven't played too much of that but mm-hmm. it's they're they're putting too much emphasis on the whole like sniping aspect so it's like basically once you've developed your yeah. accuracy skills yeah. you're you're pretty much godlike at the game and it's it's not rewarding you for anything other than being a fourteen year old so well uh, you know just just a quick aside on that um, <laughs> my favorite you know I say this in quotes but my favorite example of sniping being very good is a uh, perfect dart that came out on N- Nintendo 64. It's what R- Rare did as a sequel when they lost the uh, Bond license. Mm-hmm. There's a gun in that game. It's called the Far Sight. That uh, you, it has a mode where it, it'll auto aim. It'll like seek out people and aim for you. And it can also <laughs> shoot through walls. Wow. So you could, you know, sit there and it, you know, it just aim for you, it find them, you shoot them. And then the best part was they have it's a like a win button. Yeah, they have a laptop gun. It's a gun, you know, it's a laptop that turns into a gun and you could set it up as a sentry turret. So you oh, could wow. just sit there oh, and protect yourself. So wow. yeah, you know, that's when I think of like great sniping, I think of that. It's just like, you know, n- not many games match that, but that's yeah. ridiculous. Oh my god. Yeah, but yeah. But hey, at least it gives you know people who aren't fourteen a chance. That's to right, exactly. Compete yeah. in a game. That's not there was plenty of other bad stuff in that, you know, really good stuff too. So yeah, well, you, you got to take the bad with the good. That's I, right, I suppose. But so I, I, I guess you know now that we've talked about you know the other genres a little bit. Maybe it's yeah. okay to sprinkle back some <laughs> some fighting games yes. back in there. You know, but I mean that's that's our roots. That's you know we've we've both played more than our share of them. <laughs> Perhaps too much. Yes. Um, we're, we're probably going to after this. Um, but <laughs> so I, I mean, I mean, I, I know I have an example right off the bat. But okay. I mean, can, can you think of like an example? And I'm not trying to like put you on a spot. Anymore. No, that's I know fine. you have examples too. But like, where it's like balanced. Like the the company hasn't gotten it right off the bat, and they try and like patch it and patch it and patch it mm-hmm. and do all these things yeah. uh, to try and correct it, and it kind of kills the community. Like it just doesn't work out. Yeah. It's um, like even though they're making the game better theoretically mm-hmm. like it's yeah. still um yeah uh i i know i know what i probably know your example but um i will i will kind of say that um i was going to get to this but i'm glad you brought it up you know fighting games have been in terms of patching very it's very recent compared yeah. to oh, yeah, yeah. first person shooters and especially like starcraft right it's very recent so you know i was thinking about this actually in the way here Kind of the way that patching's been done in uh, fighting games, <clears throat> excuse me, is you know they kind of release a whole new version of the game, and then they you know they Especially force if you your to buy. company yes. name is Capcom. Yeah. So the best example I can think of, just right off the bat, is um, they released a game called X Men versus Street Fighter, which you know was the first time you know like you could play like Ryu or Ken from Street Fighter against like Wolverine, Magneto. Yeah, it was really I think cool. it was kind of like one of the first like, if not the first like two on two. Yeah, player. it was. And the it was a great game, but it's incredibly it's incredibly broken. I mean, it's it's it, it's very. It, it, I mean, everyone has yeah. infinite. Everyone has just infinite combos, which you know never stop. So what they did was they took that feedback and they released a new version of the game called Marvel Superheroes vs. Street Fighter, and they went to great lengths to remove all the infinite combos. And they they did basically. There's only one or two in that version. But what they did as soon as they did that is they they kind of watered everyone down. So everyone is kind of bland. And you know, not very interesting. And you know, the competitive scene for that game was far smaller than X Men versus Street Fighter. Yeah. And fighting games, as Brad knows, the fighting game community will they will play a new version of the game, 
Uh, uh, and then if it's not as good as the old version, they'll probably just go back to the old version and let yeah. the, the new one die. So, yeah, yeah. But yeah, go ahead. That, yeah. That's my example that immediately came to mind. Well, I, I do, I do, I, I do think that it, that that one is pretty interesting. I mean, you, you could actually argue that like X Men Street Fighter, even though it was broken, like every character like mm-hmm. did ridiculous amounts of damage, it was probably still balanced. Yeah. Well, so you know, and it's funny because you know, knowing Capcom, and you know, I preface a lot of what I'm saying with you know, people who are listening to this in the fighting games, they're gonna know about this already. But actually, in X Men versus Street Fighter, there's three different versions of the game. So what it is is there's a version one which is yeah I thought there were two yeah okay there, version one is the early Japanese arcade version oh, okay, okay and then version two is probably what if you've ever played the game in an arcade cabinet you've played the U.S. version is version two most of the Japanese is that too now version three is later arcade boards that were built and like the Sega Saturn and the console ports were based on version three okay. hmm. version one is like ridiculously broken you have like um i I didn't even know this but i watched a video of it like ryu he can do like a hundred percent combo because his he has a he has a hurricane kick if Mm. you're familiar with street fighter and he has a a, like a super version of that which basically just does more hits and more damage um well they have a glitch in that game in that version of the game where if you do that super it it hits you down on the ground but you immediately bounce back up so and, and in Street Fighter, you hold back the block, right? Block and attack so they don't hit you. But you actually have to hold forward to recover. So if you just hold back, like, you know, you're trained to do, he can just do another combo on you and kill you. It's like, okay. Well, but yes. So if you hold like, forward, you recover, game. but you can get hit again. Whereas yeah. if you hold back, you don't recover. And he yeah. can... Needless to say, they, you know, they, they made things yeah. right. Right, right. But, right. uh, yeah. I, I would say too little, too late, but I mean the game, yeah. the franchise is going on. I, but I, I agree with you. I mean, X Men versus Street Fighter is very open ended. It's yeah, you know, it's. I, I mean, as far as I know about the game, like it's th- there's no like one duo because you know I mean you play as two characters at a time. There's there's yeah. no two characters that is just head and shoulders above the rest. Whereas or is the sequel to that Marvel Superheroes versus Street Fighter. Yeah. Wolverine, you know, he's like—I think he's like the only character in the game with like an easy to do infinite. Yep. You just speed up, you literally mash one button, and you win the game. Yeah, it's, he. It's pretty terrible. Like that killed the game. Yeah, I mean, he was. Yeah, I mean, any competitive team, you know, if you weren't, if you didn't have Wolverine as one or two guys, you weren't taking the game seriously. Exactly. And that's. Yeah. And you know, that's a perfect example of you know too overpowered of a character, and you know, there's plenty of fighting games where that's the case yeah it's like the example i gave in the intro it's like if rock beat paper and scissors and and like you don't pick rock you're a moron you don't know how to play the game exactly yeah i mean you You just don't know you know fighting games are littered with that just because of the nature of the game yeah but yeah and so i I mean (laughs) kind of what you were saying it's uh, i mean kind of like fighting games kind of had their their initial yeah, they, they had their birth like on arcade cabinets, which yeah. much much more difficult to patch yep. than yeah. you know consoles and PCs have been. And you know, and and realistically, when you think about it, you know, um, you know, not to offend any Tekken fans that have been out there, but you know, Street Fighter has kind of been you know the model fran- you know the lead franchise in fighting games when most people think about it oh you just made them so angry i know i'm sorry but uh you know and it's really been on consoles you know the pc support is really just kind of picked up you know here in the past couple of years so you know 360 and stuff they didn't patch as much not as enough where's my where's my marvel 3 steam version yeah well yeah, I agree. But it is what it is. Like, yeah. The engine is for PC, too. What the hell? <laughs> anyway, anyway. We will get into that. Yeah, yeah. It's a separate podcast. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, so, anyway, we're talking about patching. <laughs> yes, patching. But, it, so, it's, it, I mean, um, it's, you know, it's... It's it's been difficult. Like, uh, okay, okay, you were talking about Tekken mm-hmm. uh, and how like Street Fighter is like the model friend well, yeah. franchise yeah. fighting yeah. games. Uh, did you have more on that? or? Oh, I mean... Uh, <laughs> I feel like we didn't finish the thought. No, it's okay. I mean, you know, basically, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, you know, this might not surprise many people, but generally, you know, people who play, like, 2D fighting games like Street Fighter typically don't play 3D fighting games like Tekken. Right. It's, it's, a different, it's a different mindset. It's, you know... It's a third dimension for, you know, it's, I mean, it's that simple. Uh, but, you know, you, you've got a, you know, you, there, there's different, it, it's for different people. Right. 
It's for a different kind of style, you know. Different strokes for different folks. Exactly. It. Yeah. I mean, that's you know, I it wasn't necessarily a shot at you know Tekken by any means, but you know. like your your Twitter's already blowing up. I know. So. Yeah. Good thing we didn't give that hand. Follow him out so. at NG. Yeah, that's right. Good luck trying to spell it. I'm not going to spell it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but A N. <laughs> yeah, yeah, figure it out. <laughs> but uh, so, okay. So the, the example I was going to give of bad mm-hmm. balance kind of destroying the community mm-hmm. was kind of what we went through recently with uh, Mortal Kombat Nine mm-hmm. MK Nine. So I mean, that's the game where it's like you know it came out there were balance issues with it and they kind of put out like patch after patch yeah you know kind of trying to fix it yeah and it kind of seemed like see i i I kind of have a theory about it well i I think it's a pretty well supported theory but competitive players like once they kind of latch onto something or like you know they they get an edge with like some characters they don't ever want to give that up like like they don't they don't want the game to change at all they don't yeah you know it's like if you've kind of spent your Build, built your career around some kind of yep. strategy or exploit that's worked out for you. You don't, you, you don't want the rules to change and to kind of have that competitive advantage eroded. So I, yeah. I, I kind of feel like if you if you release a game and the balance isn't good right away, mm-hmm. it's you you have like a very small window to kind of fix that. Uh, otherwise, you risk kind of alienating the people who have put in the time and kind of learned the the broken game and. Uh, I, I actually and I have a uh, I have an example of that and sure. it comes back to Marvel three I'm sure you remember this but they uh, Marvel vs Capcom three came out and uh, you know there was a lot of you know outcry early and everything that uh, Sentinel was very good yeah. in that game so I mean I can't remember I think it was it was within a month that they patched his health down it was something like that yeah it, it was really quick they they removed I mean. For, and for those who don't know, like Sentinel was like one of the, and you know, for for those of you who have seen, um, you know, the most recent X Men movie, mm-hmm. uh, Days of Future Past, you should you should know that you know Sentinel is of course an unholy godless killing machine, and he was certainly that in yeah. yeah. And he was that in a Marvel vs. Capcom two. So I, I think originally they weren't going to put him in three. Yeah. But yeah. you know our our That's hero Seth Killian, he fought to yeah. have him included, and he was. And kind of like right off the bat, he was absolutely one of the most dominant characters in the game. Like for those of you who don't know, like this is a game where it's like one combo generally will kill you, mm-hmm. and Sentinel could do that like extremely easily. Like anyone who hadn't like put any effort into the game, basically it's just kind of like you press buttons, you swing these giant limbs of his if they hit you get a combo off of it which will likely lead to death mm-hmm. and he also had a ton of health so like you also he was this incredibly dangerous character who like yeah. couldn't be killed he he definitely goes back into what you referenced earlier you know it's like he he was a character it's very easy to pick up it was very you know simple straightforward you know ideas on how to dominate people mm-hmm. and you know it was upsetting a lot of people but you know capcom they took the risk early on and you know put down the health quite a bit and you know i mean now with the state of the game it, yeah he went from like having like the the most health in the yeah. game to like below average yeah i mean it was a very stark change yeah. i remember it and you know the game's kind of worked out to where you know he's probably not as strong even if he had the health mm-hmm. as he did then. Right. But that right. but that was a you know an example of like they changed the they shifted it very early when they had right. the chance. Yeah. 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 And you know and I think I think the the mindset you described especially in the fighting game community is you know born from the fact that you know like we said we we were used to getting one version of the game and that was it. Right. You yeah. Know, you could complain about it and you know everything but. If you wanted to play it, you had to play it. So. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, Capcom has had a very hands-off approach to patching, even, even in this modern day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of feel like they still have the mindset, like, oh, let's just charge everyone 40 bucks for, for a new version of the game <laughs> instead of patching it. But I, I do... <laughs> I don't disagree. Yeah, I, I know, so. yeah, yeah. I, I know. But, uh, you know, it's I, I almost feel like it's easier for, uh, you know, because, I mean, we were just talking about how it's like if you patch a game, like, 
people who have had a long history with the game, like they're they're not going to enjoy their competitive advantage being eroded, and so they're going to kind of rage quit the game. I don't feel like that happens quite as much. Like if you release like a new version of the game that that yeah. also has like obviously it's patched and you know has balance changes and everything, but also introduces new things. Right. Like I mean, like we just also had like the I think the forty third version of Street Fighter Four come out. Yeah, it um, seems ul- like it. Yeah. Ul- Ultra Street Fighter Four, and yeah. uh, you know I mean for a long time they were. T- Teasing that game, and uh, yeah. you know, in, in some cases, maybe a little too much. Hashtag DiCapri. Um, but you know, it's I mean, like all the hardcore players. I mean, they were all looking forward to it. You know, they, yeah. they weren't you know too concerned that their character was getting nerfed. I I, I think it might have been easier to accept because you know it's a new game. It's, yeah. it's kind of a fresh start for everyone. I, I I agree, and you know, I think it's yeah. I, for the most part, I agree. You know, it. it I think. You know, now we're more receptive than when they first started ba- patching the game. You know, Marvel 3, that Sentinel patch, the health patch was, you know, that was really like the first example of Capcom going in. It's like, okay, yeah, we've heard your we've heard your cries and we're going to do this. Yeah. So it was like the first time that had happened. And, and, and there's some like, speculation Whoa! that maybe they were already planning on doing that, but who, who, who knows? Who yeah, knows exactly. I mean? we, we're not privy to that information. You know, when you have Seth Killian on next week, he can yeah, yeah. confirm or deny that. So. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> coming up next week. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we've kind of talked a little bit about how, you know, there, there are games that have some bad balance and, and balance issues. What, what what do you think is an example of a game that's well balanced, and, and how what, what kind of impact do you think that has on the community? So, um, you know, I I've been thinking about this. You know, there are examples in fighting games where things are you know traditionally traditionally considered, if I can speak, uh, well balanced. It's, okay. it's, it's, um, it's a challenge for me as well. Uh, you know, the one of the classic examples that I think of is uh, the last version of Street Fighter 2, uh, the aptly named Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. You know, it's quite a long name, but <laughs> people mostly call it Super Turbo. Um, that game, you know, realistically, it's been played forever. It's Yeah, it's 20 years old now. But you know they're still competitive. This is the point where the only people who are good at it are very old men. Yes, but you know it's traditionally held in high regard as fairly balanced. Now, of course, you know in any competitive kind of mindset, you know there's going to be someone, a couple characters that are better than the others. But you know um, that game is, and and I think Dalzim is one of those, right? Yeah, yeah. But but at the same time, like you still don't see every tournament being littered with with Dalzim players, and if. If, if I think of, of a lot of players, I mean, this is kind of what I was talking about uh, in my intro. Mm-hmm. Like, if everyone picked that character, yeah. they would probably do worse than if they pick a character who was conducive to, to their style. So the ST is really interesting because um, it, it's one of the more um, stark examples of a fighting game to where this really comes in. Um, <clears throat> I, we're, we're, it's really good, but uh, it's the concept of what's called counterpicking. And... Uh, so Brad is right, you know, Dalsim is generally considered, you know, probably the best character in the I game. I know a thing he's, or two. He's very, you know, he's very good. And, um, you know, he dominates most of the matchups, but he has one losing matchup, and it's to uh, E. Honda, who's the sumo guy. And he actually, you know, he... You know, he doesn't like outright. Get him, Mike like, Ross. You know, he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't like outright. You know, like round one begin lose. But you know, E Honda has his move set and what he can do handles Dalsim's tricks really well. Mm-hmm. So and it's like, okay, well, naturally Honda must be a great character. Mm-hmm. Well, he's he's considered all right. I mean, he he you know he does well against some characters, but there's some characters that he can't compete with at all. Mm-hmm. And you see that game is very you know it's very rich and like. Wow, you know this guy is completely destroying this one character, but this character, you know, can handle him no problem. And then, you know, it's very there's there's a weird kind of you know balance because, in my personal opinion, I could be right or wrong, but you know, Brad and I have talked about this before. That game to me is most of not all the characters have something that is extremely powerful, mm-hmm. extremely you know broken air quotes for lack of a better term mm-hmm. that you know completely dominate other characters mm-hmm. if they're given in a situation. So you know it kind of achieves balance by everyone has this amazing stuff that if they can actually do it, it's going right. to end very quickly right yeah. yeah yeah, you know and I, I, I think you know going back to 
<laughs> my favorite game once again. But no, I mean, I, I think Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is is definitely like that in a lot of ways. Like, you, you'll have a character who's considered low tier, you know, not that great. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, like maybe like Chris Redfield. Yeah. But then again, he has these grenades where he can just throw them. And if you hit him at any point while those are out, those will explode. And if they explode mm-hmm. while you're near them, under them, anything, <laughs> you, get, you get pinned in the fire that comes out of that grenade. And then right. he gets a free combo off you. Right. Which actually is pretty bad for characters like uh, you know, good characters. I mean, even like, like Morgan. Mor- Morgan's yeah. like probably considered the best character in the game, and she has a rough time against him. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know that that's kind of another example. Of, I mean, it's, it's a, I think it's a it's it's very similar to the Honda beating Dalzim. Yeah, and you know, at first glance, it may not be immediately you know obvious, especially right. if you know if you don't have experience against it or you mm. haven't seen it. But right. it's really you know once. Once you have an understanding of what makes Dahl seem good, and then you can understand, you know, and you understand what E Honda's tool set is, it's like, okay, yeah, I can see why he would give him some problems. Exactly, yeah. But you know, it's it's because the game is designed that way, where you get where you do kind of have like a true rock paper scissors kind of situation, although not quite. Yeah. Um, it, it's it, it keeps you on your toes, like no matter what. Like, yeah. You can't just look at the materials and be like, oh, this character is good. Okay, well, I'll pick them. <laughs> and even if it's even if that character is conducive to your playstyle and they're like the best character. You still have to be on the the, the lookout for bad matchups. Uh, you, yeah, you got to have a contingency plan if you know someone picks a Honda. You know, maybe you pick the counter character yeah. to Honda, so mm-hmm. you learn Dalsim and whoever. Uh, d- who, whoever Ryu, I guess. Yeah, it basically in that game, Honda he has a very hard time against any character with a fireball. So you know, yeah. Ryu. See, Ryu is his owner. So old Sagat. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, any yeah. So that's tiger, a great example. Tiger, tiger. <laughs> exactly, but. Yeah, you know, I and I going back to what Brad just said about, you know, hey, you know, I can oh, this guy's the best character in the game, so I'm just gonna learn how to play him. Um, the game that we have the most experience with, Marvel vs. Capcom two, and I, I don't think I'm putting words in your mouth, but also yeah. Marvel vs. Capcom three, you know, in Marvel vs. Capcom two the best character who ended up being the best character was Magneto. Yeah. But Magneto does not fit Brad and I's playstyle. Zero. Yeah, absolutely does not. <laughs> Zero is You have to have hands that aren't made out of like cinder blocks. So Zero is not a good, not a good pick. Consensus top three easy, yeah, probably. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He he's not our play style. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he's you know it's just it's exactly what Brad said, you know, it's it, in that game where there's, you know, a little bit of balance and there's a wide variety of options and play styles that are viable. Mm-hmm. You're you can much you know it's like hey well I'm gonna play the guys I want and you know fit my style mm-hmm. and you can compete with them yeah. and there's plenty of fighting games where you can't do that right so yeah it's you know it's it's funny I mean, I mean you'd also think that you know the the three best characters like oh well, you know maybe I'll just pick all of them and put them yeah. on a team but you kind of end up with like the the kind of Miami Heat situation like I mean for those who don't know like uh, in in sports so I mean a, a few years ago like they you know some of the three best players in the in the NBA. They all kind of got together and decided they wanted to play on the same team together. They they took less money individually so they could all play together. And they they their their play styles didn't really like mesh together. You know, it's right. like two of them, you know, like LeBron and Dwayne, they kind of had similar play styles, so they right. didn't really complement each other. Yeah. And kind of because of that, you know, they they probably didn't do as well as they weren't as dominant as right. as they might have been if maybe some of the players were a little worse but better fit together yeah. so so a perfect example of what Brad's saying is in you know once again we go to Marvel versus Capcom 3 but uh, in in those games the uh, you pick three characters and then you know your other characters that are not you're not currently playing they can come in and do like a helper attack for you mm-hmm. and you know the best teams in the game are you know they usually have a you know a helper attack they're called assists in that game that is you know very tailored for the other characters, you know, goals. It's like, you know, it, it's very good. So if you went in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and just looked at the three best characters and, you know, just for argument's sake, let's say the team you come up with is Morgan, Zero, Virgil, it's, you know, yeah, you have the three best characters in the game, probably, but, you know, it's not a very, there's not a lot of cohesion. You know, mm-hmm. It's just like the Miami Heat. It's like, well, great, yeah, but, you know, yeah, the, the the assists don't complement each other. You know, it's like Morgan. It's like she, she's kind of a zoning character, so you want assists to kind of stop the other characters from mm-hmm. advancing on you, so that you can keep them away and chip at you. And none of the assists that she has 
Yeah. Uh, if you know zero or virtual, they don't really do a good job of that. Right. So I mean, that's that's why you often see her paired with a, a character like Doctor Doom. He has an assist that basically he has homing missiles. <laughs> Because, yeah, right. because of course he does. Uh, so I mean, the missiles come out. They they go after you know the the character on the other team, and they 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 basically are forced to block and sit there, and, and they track. So it's you know you're gonna have a tough time advancing forward. So I mean, that kind of keeps them pinned down, and then she can kind of you know do her chip away game, which everyone loves to watch. Um, but you know, it's it's she ends up doing better with with. Doctor Doom, who's who's a worse character, despite yeah, despite uh, well, yeah. So yeah, and you know, I can think of like a a quick you know StarCraft example of this. Sure. Um, you know, going back to what we were just talking about, you know, uh, you know the Zerg. That's what I'm most familiar with. You know, it's like you can look and it's like, well, you know, the Zergling are really fast. I can build them faster than in any of the other units in the game. Um, you know, I can just overwhelm my opponent. And then, you know, the Zerg and Brood War, let's say, they have another unit that can burrow underground. Mm-hmm. And unless you have a special unit that can, like, see, you know, burrowed units, he can attack you and you can't do anything. You're just going to die. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was pretty good strategy to have, you know, those kind of paired together. But, you know, the pro- the biggest problem with that is they have no... They can't hit any air unit. So, you know, if an opponent, you know, kind of builds a more balanced approach, just have a couple air units, you know, your your army's completely wiped out, and then you're, you know, it's just, just type GG hmm. and yeah. quit the match because yeah, you're, it's yeah. over. Hmm. But that's, you know, you know it the, it kind of leads itself back to, you know, there's teamwork in different examples of, you know, like Marvel vs. Capcom 3, you know, you guys, you guys want cohesion. You want, in StarCraft, you want, you know, a decent... You know, mixture of units so you can combat it. Which, which, so. which I think is good. Yeah. I mean, you, you want people to be thinking about. You, you want people to be looking at their options multi-dimensionally. Yeah. Like, you, you don't want people looking like, oh, you know, this is the best character. Oh, this is the second best. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just pick them and mm-hmm. you know, have this like super team. Yep. So it's 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 more interesting when you have to think about. Okay, well, I have this character. What 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 other character complements them well? What yeah. You know, what, what's my opponent doing? What's it, it, you have to be a lot more strategic about it, which yep. I think makes the game more interesting and it gives it more longevity, it gives it more dimensions, <laughs> and you know, it, and it's rewarding. You for for being smart and analytical. Yeah, and you know, and you know, just in, in StarCraft, you know, there's examples. You know, you can cite sport examples, fight game examples. But in StarCraft, you know, there are builds. You know, build orders and general strategy that are called all ins. That mm-hmm. you just, you know, you go, you just go all in. Basically, you know, you sacrifice any chance of winning 10 minutes after the game has started mm-hmm. to go win in seven minutes. Right. Because it's basically, you know, a very surprise tack that, mm. I mean, if they rebuff it, it's over. You've right. lost. But, but it's, you're, you're basically, it's, to, to use another fighting game term, it's, you're kind of making like a hard read on your opponent. Exactly. So you're, yeah. you're, 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 you're think like, okay, he's going to yeah. do this. I'm going to, you know, put all my chips on the table. Yeah, bet, exactly. Bet, Just like yeah. in poker. Yeah. It's yeah. like, okay, this guy, you know, if I bet high, he'll fold. Mm-hmm. When I don't, you know, when I'm bluffing, basically, I don't yeah, have anything, yeah. or you know, it's like yeah. I'm gonna come over the top. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's you know, and that's that's really good. I mean, that that teaches you to be smart and yeah, and yeah, I mean, all, all that stuff. All yeah, that's, I mean, there's awesome. a lot of there's a lot to be learned. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, not to get too whatever reflective, but you know, the stuff like that. You know, learning how to read people, gauge reactions. Yeah, you know, when you need to go a little bit more aggressive or do like that. You know, that that applies like you know in the business world. And yeah. Stuff, oh, so. absolutely. And, you know, um, professionally and everything. So you know, I I, I kind of feel like there's. You know, I, I mean, kind of like you were saying, it's like we, we probably have the most experience in Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Yeah. But I kind of feel like with 3, I mean, this is a big reason like I like 3 a ton better, and I, and I love 2. But it's I feel like there's a lot more of that in 3, like yeah. where you have to you, you have to think about what your opponent's doing, you have to read them, you yeah. have to... Like, MVC 2, it was kind of like, okay, just pick the best character who's kind of conducive to your style, hit the buttons really hard and fast, yeah. and, you know, kind of, here's... here's a position where you have air superiority get yeah. here and that's really all there is to it you're not being you're not having to analyze your opponent it's a very brain dead game yeah. whereas MVC 3 I mean it's you know it's, it's it's completely different I mean you have to you know think about you know the characters the other yeah. person's picking uh 
you know, if they're comboing you, you know, you have to think about, uh, you know, how they're going to, you know, reset you, kind of like what they're going to do when the combo ends, because you have all these defensive options, like when a combo, it, it, there's all this stuff you have to think about with your opponent. The, yeah, and, and to build off that, you know, thinking about it, MVC2, you know, I'm trying to think of a better analogy, but I can't really. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 basically devolved into, and I'm going to say that devolved, but uh, it, oh, it, I do think it basically accurate. it basically became almost like a like a set play kind of game. It's like okay, I did I did this. Now I must do this. Okay, mm-hmm. now he you know it's mm-hmm. like okay, I did that. I have one of two things to do: do this. And it's mm-hmm. very robotic. Yeah, very right. there's not a lot of analytical thought. You know, it's like right. well, gee, maybe if he does it. No, I mean yeah. it, it was it became so distilled uh-huh. that it was just like this. Yeah, Marvel three. Is you know an argument could be made. It's like, well, we haven't been playing it as long, which you know that might be accurate. But the game system, the way the mechanics work mm-hmm. and the characters are designed, it's much more free flowing. There's much more opportunity. You know, it's like, man, I got to keep all this stuff. You know, I got to keep all this stuff on track and stuff yeah, yeah. like that. So yeah, I mean, Marvel Two was very robotic. I mean, I mean, it's like even when the game first came out, it's like, oh my god, there's like 50 characters in this game. I have no idea. Like, I mean, most of these were new characters of the franchise. It's like I don't know what any of these characters can do. I don't know what their options are. I have no no idea what the matchups are. It was just so much to keep track of. Yeah, and you know, kind of awesome. Yeah, and in Marvel Three, there is you know way more characters that are viable. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more. You know, there's a lot different. You know. You know, the guy next to you could have a completely different team yeah. and be just as viable as you yeah. are because it fits his play style better. And, like, you know, I, I mean, about earlier. I, I think part of the, the, the reason, like, I know it's it's a much better game in, in terms of balance is that if you have a certain play style and, you know, like, okay, let's say you're a grappler. I, I think you probably know mm-hmm. where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. If, if you're if you're a grappler, none of the top three characters, who, you know, the, the kind of god tier characters, <laughs> none of them are really good at grappling. So you kind of got to go, like, a different different route Mm -hmm. and you know there's a player uh you know in our in our local scene he actually got fifth at you know evolution the you know the biggest fighting game tournament in the world and he did like he he started i don't know he didn't start off but for for a while like he was using virgil who was you know one of the best characters in the game Mm -hmm. and it didn't work out for him like he you know it just wasn't working out for it i mean he's obviously a great character and everything and you know he's this guy we're talking about is a great player but you know, it's it, it just it just the, the character just didn't agree with him. You know, yeah. it wasn't conducive to his play style. So he ended up picking up like this this other team, which I think a lot of people I don't think anyone thinks it's like a really strong team. Uh, you know, he's basically he's picking Hulk, Shuma, Hagar, which is kind of yeah, it's an it's an unorthodox team. Very, very, yeah. I mean, he, he's the only one who plays it mm-hmm. actually. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, he he ended up getting fifth. Uh, you know, one of the biggest tournaments in in the world. Uh, you know, with that kind of unorthodox team. And you know, had he stuck with Virgil, like I, you know, I mean, maybe his ceiling's higher, but. Yeah, it's you know I mean he's he, he was probably never ever going to be able to you know really utilize that potential and, and the floor is a lot lower too right just yeah with his skill set you know what his you know he's very read based mm-hmm. right and you know yeah. Virgil doesn't necessarily reward you know the player for great I mean he does but you know right, not yeah. in like. Hulk is amazing. Yeah, I, I mean, for, 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 for those area. who don't know, like, I mean, you know, fighting games, like, you know, it's it, it basically, you know, you're kind of holding backwards to block or, you know, so basically if, if your character can kind of, like, get to the other side of them, like, all of a sudden they're they're not blocking anymore. Now they're holding forward because the character got to right. the other side. So basically this character Virgil like he he has a lot of moves that automatically kind of set up what's what's called a cross up uh, the mm-hmm. thing i just described so basically he can do this like super move where it's like he'll just kind of randomly like he kind of like disappears from the screen and he's just kind of like all over even though you can't see him so you never know what side he's on and he'll just all of a sudden hit you because like yeah. it's it's 50-50 whether or not you're you're going to block it it's it's really impossible to to tell and if if that hits then he can convert off that and basically kill you and kind of start the whole process again essentially yeah and it's basically that doesn't require you to make any kind of read it's just kind of like you just do it and it's, it's kind of flipping a coin like if you get heads hey look i win the game and if you get tails then oh well it doesn't really matter I'm sure you'll agree with this but it's a very marvel 2 
feeling. Yeah, it's oh, like yeah. you do it, and it's like, oh, it worked. Then I do auto combo. Yeah, but yeah, pretty much. It didn't yeah. work. Okay, I'm yeah. fine. And, yeah. Uh, but you know, he doesn't make, require you to make any hard reads, which is why he's on every team. Right, uh, <laughs> including my own. But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, just to go, I have a mine uh, tomorrow. But. I have a personal uh, kind of comeback to this. Yeah. But um, from in Brood War, my my race was the Zerg. I would, I just loved them. Everything. When StarCraft Two came out, um, you know, StarCraft people will know they changed the way the Zerg work quite a bit. They they feel very different from they did in StarCraft One and Brood War. It's extremely different. It's different demands, different everything. I I beat my head against the wall trying to be good with the Zerg because I loved them. I was like, well, I loved them in Brood War. I was good with them in Brood War, and you know, every once in a while I dabble with the Protoss and Terran, the other two races, and I you know I always had better results with the Terran with less work because they fit my play style. Uh-huh. What it was now it was yeah. you know the Zerg. Yeah. I'm trying to play the Zerg. How the Zerg were in StarCraft One, they're no longer that race. I mean, they have a lot of similarities, but at the end of the day, you know, they're very different. So, you know, actually in StarCraft Two, when I play any kind of competitively thing, I actually use the Terran, which is you know incredible to yeah, yeah. me. But now that they fit more my play style in that game much more than you know the race I used to play d- 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 with without. So I mean, they're they're they better fit your play style. Yeah. It's it, 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 instead of like. Oh, you know, t- uh, Terrans are just better. So yeah, just, they. I mean, well, I mean, it, it, you know, it's one of those things. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of debates. Yeah, of course. Generally, it is. But um, the biggest change, you know, without you know dragging us out for 900 years, how they changed the Zerg. Um, in in Brood War, you had uh, the Zerg units are built in a uh, in a central building, the building you start out with, Every, like you know races. Each race starts out with a, a building, and that's where you mine your minerals and you build like your workers. Mm-hmm. Well, the Zerg's mechanic is all all of their units are built from one building, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Where like the Terran, like if I wanted to get a Marine, I'd build him in the barrack with a building called the barracks. But if I wanted a tank, I'd build him in a factory. So you have to build, you know, different, you know, X amount of factories to get so many tanks out in a matter of time. Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Protoss is the same way. In Brood War, the mechanic was, you know, you just built multiple hatcheries. So you had tons and tons of hatcheries, Mm -hmm. and then you can just build all these units all at once. Mm -hmm. Well, what they did, uh, they changed the, they kind of made it, introduced a new mechanic. They took an old character, uh, an old unit that really no one used, and they kind of recast it. And uh, basically what they did now was, instead of building multiple hatcheries like you used to, they reward you with building one, and then using this uh, unit called the Queen, she'd spawn larva because what it, the Zerg mechanic was, it would you know you'd have three little larva per uh, hatchery. You build a unit, then they you know regenerate every X amount of seconds. Mm-hmm. But this new mechanic with the Queen, she would spawn larva, and it would double your larva count. Hmm. So you know you could get away with having less hatcheries, but you can build more units. So it's like oh cool great. Mm-hmm. But the problem is with that is that. You know, and that uh, that strategy of making sure you have enough minerals, you're building people at the right time. That's called macro. So the macro uh, completely changed with the Zerg because you always had to make sure you timed your your uh, spawn lava right. You could always never have. You know, you always had to. Yeah, I had way more to keep track of mm-hmm. because the Zerg units were always you know less pound for pound than the Terran or Protoss units. Mm-hmm. So. It got it, you got bogged down very quickly in that, and you know I couldn't concentrate on what I used to. The Terran, you know, they're more or less like they were in Brood War and Starcraft One, so I could concentrate more on you know tactics and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it just turned out to be like that. I just, you know, it, it's very different. You know, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of old Zerg players who don't yeah. play them anymore because it's right. so different. Yeah, yeah, it's you know it's. It's it, it's amazing how like when you have a like a really competitive game like this, it's it's amazing just how like one tiny change can mm-hmm. make just like an absolute yeah world of difference. I mean that's a perfect example of it. It's you know I you know Marvel when Marvel three came out, I played basically a variation of what my Marvel two team was, yeah, and uh, the too. problem was is that. The characters, you know, those characters might have been the same in Marvel 3, you know, the same character, but they play completely differently. Mm -hmm. And I found out that, you know, I was basically doing myself a disservice. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's 
don't get me wrong. There's plenty of players who can just play, you know, Ryu through every game or Ken through every game or whatever. But, yes, you know, I'm definitely not that person. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I get too confused. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm trying to do Marvel 2 stuff in Marvel 3. Yeah, oh, yeah, that yeah. That doesn't work. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean... Every once in a while, I'll, I'll try and go back to two, and it's like I can't do anything yeah. in that game. It's but like, just to kind of wrap this up nicely in a bow with what we've been talking about, like I think if a game is balanced well, that it actually it, re- it will reward the player for showing like their individuality mm-hmm. and their creativity mm-hmm. because it will reward my play style correctly. Yeah, right. Yeah, Marvel Three is a great example of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's the way the game is structured. It's you know the system mechanics and everything. It rewards. Wow, yeah, you can actually be pretty original and do very well in the game. Yeah, yeah. And as opposed to other games where it's not like that. Yeah, yeah. And so, j- just to kind of put my own little little bow on this. So if you're, I guess, like say you're, I, whoa, <laughs> see, yeah. So I smack <laughs> random things with my pen here. If if you're designing a game, uh, I, I, I guess then what would be the proper way to actually achieve balance mm-hmm. uh, in a game? So I, I, I guess you know, kind of what I said in the in the intro is like to kind of really make things situational. And yeah. so it, it'd be it'd be you, you have to you know be conscious of you know like play style of characters, yes. different strengths and weaknesses different yeah. people have because I mean everyone's different, right? Um, and you know, then also kind of like, uh, kind of like situations within the game where certain things are, are mm-hmm. more viable. So, you know, if, if you're if you're trying to like balance the you know like the sniper rifle in a game, yeah. for instance, like you know, I mean, maybe you don't want every map to be gigantic, or yeah. you know, and, or kind of have like more closed in areas in like right. sections of maps. And you know, I mean, it in an, in a sniper rifle, it kind of has the natural disadvantage of generally in most games when you, you know it's a single shot and you have you're, you have to sit there and reload so you know someone can like walk up to you with a machine gun and just you know hold the trigger and shoot right. you by the time you can get another shot off so yeah but yeah it, it's yeah. yeah it definitely has to be situationally balanced right for lack yeah. of a better phrase yeah and I, I mean I'm, I'm working on something new that's kind of like a, a tower defense kind of thing and that's you know that, that's something I'm trying to be very cognizant of you know it's like yeah you know it's like I gotta make sure like okay this this one time Power is isn't just like automatically gray. Just put it everywhere. It, it, you got to be careful to make sure, like, okay, in the situation when yeah. pair with these other things and against these certain monsters, yada yeah. yada. That makes total yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 and in rack, I mean, that's that's something I try to be conscious of with with the weapons. You know, it's like each weapon kind of like its own certain role. You know, so yep. the, the pistol was like good for like single enemies at a distance, whereas the right. shotgun was good for like up close little groups of enemies. Yeah, so. and I mean, you, you know, you find that in any competitive thing you know yeah. sports you know in baseball it's better to bunt a you bunt or hit or right, steal yeah. a base yeah. or in football it's better to pass yeah. here or run here or, yeah you know and fighting I, and games I, it's better to hold back or attack and i yeah, mean it's yeah. just it's it's everywhere yeah and you know and, and, and in baseball it's like you'll you'll draft players based on what your needs are and, yeah and i mean those needs vary from team to team you know it's like you ask like different people you know in an upcoming gra- draft and like any sport you know it's like what's your draft order you know it's mm-hmm. like and it's different for every team and it should be right you know like different teams have different philosophies and exactly. different different needs and yep all that yeah so. exactly so cool well is there anything else you you wanted to add or uh, i mean you know pretty much i mean um i think it's you know Closing thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I love competitive games. Um, I mean, I feel there's a lot you can learn from them. Oh yeah, and oh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of life skills that oh, you may not, you know, immediately be aware of. And I, I, I think like, that's oh. you know, I, I mean, kind of going back to the first episode of the podcast a little bit. I, I mean, like, is it, in the end, isn't that really what it's all about? Yeah, you know, it's you know, it's sure it's entertaining, but why is it entertaining? Because it, it I, helps you. I I can I can say you know, in any competitive game, you know, whether it be Modern Warfare, let's say, or, you know, even Dota, League of Legends, you know, oh, fighting game. We should have talked about Dota more. That game is huge. <laughs> fighting game, anything like that. You learn, and this is one of the, this is a most important life skill, not the most important, but very important. You learn the ability to adapt to yeah. the situation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you learn it. It's great. Adapt that will, or die. That will serve you in all walks of life. Yeah. It's yeah. very good. And, you know, in a fighting game or StarCraft, let's say, you learn dedication. 
you you learn to you know perfect whatever you're gonna do if you really want to take that next step it's mm-hmm. like wow i'm tired of losing to this guy or mm-hmm. wow i'm tired of losing to this race all the time i'm gonna sit yeah. here you know map it out right. that being able to plan organize drill that drill that into you that's great i mean those yeah. are real life skills that'll help you and stuff and then you know playing fighting games has helped my reactions mm-hmm. quite a bit but yeah you know, that's yeah. just another thing but, and I, I mean i was thinking a bunch yesterday it's like you know do do games uh you know try and uh Try and build on the, the build up reaction skills and test reaction skills too much, but you know, if, if you're driving a car that's and right. you know there's something coming, you know another car that's yeah. in the wrong lane, which happened to me if you, you know a couple <laughs> weeks ago. I mean, yep. thankfully it was just a little neighborhood road, not you know the, yeah. the interstate. But no, I mean reaction skills are, are very important. To and you know, it's survive, just survival. you can learn. Yeah, I mean, it, I think with you know. I'm not necessarily even fighting games, but with competitive games, you know, you you'll learn a lot of stuff that may not be, you may not consciously be aware of, but mm-hmm. you know, later on you're like, oh yeah, you know, you know, kind of connect the dots and stuff. Absolutely, but I know I've learned quite a bit and didn't even realize it. So. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So the moral of the story is, you know, tell mom and the dad. The moral of the story is video games. Yeah, the moral of the story is, mom and dad, it's okay if I play StarCraft all weekend. I'm learning, you know, <laughs> I'm learning actions per minute, you know. <laughs> I'm building up my finger. Muscles, exactly. So. Right. Right. It's that's more important than turning in that paper. Right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It'll write itself later. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for being on. Oh, thanks for having yeah, me, Brad. Th- thanks for coming by. Thanks for coming and doing this in person. Sure. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yes. Thank you. So that was my conversation with Andrew Rosnowski. I hope that wasn't too fighting game heavy. Try to include some other genres in there. There was a lot of StarCraft discussion, some first-person shooter discussion. So if you're not a big fighting game fan, hopefully you still find that all quite interesting. I realize there were some slight audio issues with that. I think I might have to put the microphone up on a pillow or something so it's not picking up all the vibrations from bumping the table and whatnot. So... We'll do better the next time, and I thank you for putting up with that. Now, one of the things that we didn't end up mentioning, but is pretty interesting when it comes to balance, is the idea of banning characters. So, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, the new Smash Brothers game that just came out. Well, in one of the earlier versions of the game, uh, Super Smash Brothers Brawl, there was actually a character in the game who was just incredibly overpowered, uh, and that character was Meta Knight. And they actually ended up banning him from tournaments because he was just so incredibly dominant. It's it's basically if you weren't using that character, like you you basically didn't want to win, and it just made the game terrible to watch for the audience and also fairly boring to play. So he actually ended up getting banned uh, in a lot of different tournaments. Um, and it, it actually made the game uh, more interesting. You know, it really added to character variety and diversity and just made the game uh, better as a whole. So it's kind of funny how sometimes the community can end up uh, correcting balance mistakes on the part of designers. So that's going to do it for this week. If you'd like to get in contact with me, uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I am at FBE Carnival. Uh, if you have comments or questions, you want a topic you'd like discussed on a future podcast, certainly let me know. Uh, until then, we'll be back next week. Thanks, guys. Bye.